Welcome this weekend. I'm stunned that you're here um, because of the time change. It just messes everybody up. Welcome online, whatever time zone you're in. Um, I heard of this church back in the Midwest. It was a small church in a small town, you know, church of 100 in a town of about 500. And they decided to take the time change differently. They said, we will not move our clocks at 2 a.m. in the morning. We will all do it at church together at the same time. And uh, so that's what they did. And they would all sit there, okay, let's all make it 11 o'clock. And they did. And I thought that was the coolest idea. And uh, it's like, that would never work here. Uh, it just, it would never work. So we just stumbled through the time change weekend. So when people come in, in about, um, 20, 30, in about 30 minutes, uh, let's greet them with smiles. And I'm glad that they're here for the last five minutes and uh, be gracious to them. And all of you that missed the nine o'clock service, welcome. We are glad that you're here. It's pretty cool. A Room Called Grace, this uh, topic and this particular concept is very personal to me. It's personal, and that's why there's passion behind it. I was raised in church, which was a very good thing, and I'm very grateful for it. And being raised in church uh, answered the big questions of my life, well, like, who am I? Where did I come from? Why, what's the purpose and meaning of life? What happens after I die? Those base core questions of our soul uh, found answers in, what, in the way I was raised. Uh, my family had faith, and that was a good thing. But eventually, there was a challenge of this is the faith of my parents. Is this going to be mine? Uh, and eventually that did occur. I was baptized when I was eight, and I had a childlike faith, and I believe it took that I understood enough about I needed to be forgiven, and I think my, my faith journey started. But when I became a middle schooler, and then as a, for, a freshman and sophomore year, is when I became fake. And what I mean by that was I watched my older brother get in trouble <laughs> as he rebelled against my parents' standards. Uh, and I go, I'm going to be smarter than him. So I, I was really good at hiding my two-part life. Um, I was one way at church, and I was another way at school. It's just the way it was. I wanted to be cool, and I was, I was cool. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, at least I thought so. <laughs> and then there was this moment. It was my junior year. It was the fall of my junior year, and it was at my buddy Marty's house, and I was in the basement, and uh, he walked up to me with a Coors beer. And the fact that I rejected a Coors beer, some of you fully understand, but it wasn't, uh, it was a, a turning point for me. Because up, drinking alcohol was not something that was in my parents' standards and something in my faith, and it was uh, not a good thing for a Christian kid to do. And it was illegal and all of that, but it was, uh, for me, uh, it was a, a moment. And I said no to that opportunity to drink beer, and that was my come to Jesus moment. It wasn't at uh, Billy Graham crusade on the third verse of just as I am. It wasn't at a CIY church camp event uh, where I came forward in an invitation. It wasn't at a church where there was a moving message and I came forward. I was at a beer party in a basement of my buddies. And I said no. And for me, that was for two reasons. One, I said no. One is I was tired of being fake. I was sick and tired. Uh, you guys ever heard about that phrase for those of you that are in Celebrate Recovery, where you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you get tired of lying, tired of being hypocritical, tired of being fake, tired of covering up, tired of, and you just go, no, I'm tired. I'm done with that. Second thing was my dad wouldn't believe something that wasn't true. And my dad was a strong influence in my life. He was the same on Monday as he was on Sunday, a strong Christian man. And uh, for some reason, I said, this is my, this is my faith. And so at six, from 16 and a half on, I've been living my faith, not my parents' faith. And uh, led in the church, did active things. I was in, I went to college at a secular university, but I was a Christian when I went there. So I got involved in Christian stuff, meaning fellowship of Christian athletes, served at a church, and I kept serving, and, and I was wanting to be a good Christian. And here's where there's an unintended consequence of that very sincere, honest desire. 
If I'm going to follow Jesus, I really want to do it well. And then there's this competitive side of me that I want to do it really well. I'm a high achiever. I mean, I got A's, so I'm going to be an A as a Christian. So I'm really going to follow the rules. I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to really go after it, and, um, and I, I, I keep score. I'm competitive. And so there were a couple of unintended consequences on the dark side of what sounds good. I really want to serve God. I really want to do well. I want to be a good Christian. What's wrong with that? Well, the unintended consequence can be this. I I keep score. And if I keep score, I want to know if I'm winning. And very often, if I'm winning against you. And that's the second unintended consequence. It turns into a self-righteousness. I'm ahead of you. I'm better than you. And I wasn't trying to do that. And when I say it that clearly, it sounds horrible. But there was some of that in me. And innocent. I wasn't trying to achieve that, but that was an unintended consequence of trying to be a good Christian and follow the rules and do it right. And uh, what I did not understand was what we, this wonderful piece of art, explained last week. I was on the works train. Even though I had been saved by grace, and I believe my baptism was meaningful and life-changing, I just didn't know what grace was. I was saved by grace, but I had no clue what it was. I was working to try to be good enough. And maybe if I am good enough and I earn God's pleasure, then he'll give me good favor. I was on the works train. There was one other unintended consequence that I didn't know that was there. And it had to do with my sureness of salvation. If somebody came up to me and they said, Kevin, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? I I said, I hope so. And I thought that was a really solid answer until I really looked at it. I had friends that came from different theological backgrounds that were Christians. And one of those is the predestination thing where God chooses you so you are saved no matter what. And that's a whole another conversation. And there are those believe in the once saved, always saved idea and no matter what. But some of my buddies in high school, when they say, hey, ask me if I'm saved. Absolutely, yes. And I go, how arrogant. Because I knew them and they weren't that good. <laughs> and I thought that was so braggadocious and so wrong that I felt spiritually righteous by saying, I hope so. That sounded very humble. <laughs> Which is stupid. And then, and, but here's the other, the dark side of the I hope so answer. Inside of it was, I was holding on that I still had something to do with my salvation. And it was this, because I figured if uh, I knew what right and wrong was, and I was trying to do right most of the time, but I knew, just like my mom was good at seeing and catching me doing stuff that was wrong, uh, my teachers, my coaches, other people, that God was better at finding everything out. And he also had that cam in your heart and knew your motives. And so he was recording everything. And I was in trouble with him. And I just, I go, I go if, if he comes back, if Jesus comes back, or if I die right in the middle, I'm going to be in the middle of a bad sin. And if I'm in the middle of a bad sin when Jesus comes back or, God, or I die, I'm toast. As a matter of fact, I'm burnt toast. Because I won't have a chance to ask for forgiveness. I won't have a chance to make it up and earn and deserve it back. So I'm, I'm, I'm history. And so I can't say, yeah. All I could say was, I hope so. And here's a question. Is that how God wants me to feel? Does he want me to be in this unsure, I hope so place? Years later, as I became a parent, it became even more clear about how unhealthy that is. Because I don't want anyone walking up to one of my kids and saying, hey, tell me about your relationship with your dad. Does he love you? And I don't want one of my kids saying, well, I'm not sure. Haven't been the best kid. I think he does sometimes. When I'm a good kid, he loves me. It's like, what? (laughs) I love you no matter what. There's nothing you can do as my kid that would make me not love you. If I want my kids to feel that way about our relationship, how does God want us to feel about this relationship? I hope so wasn't a good enough answer. And I didn't know that until I got grace. Last weekend, we introduced the idea of grace, that we are saved by grace through faith and good works is the caboose. 
We're saved by grace, not by doing enough to be good enough. We're saved by grace, the act of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and the offering of that gift for our salvation. Last weekend, we talked about Romans chapter three, where Paul, in the first eight chapters of Romans, who is a lawyer, a Pharisee, made the case for grace, an eight chapter uh, presentation. And he did that because it is so profound and so deep, and he wanted to state the case so clearly, specifically to Jewish Christians who understand law keeping. And as he got to Romans three, he said, there is a righteousness apart from law that you can now have your saved by grace through faith. That was two chapters ago. He validated in Romans four with talking about Abraham and God and their relationship. And now in Romans five is where we're gonna do round two. To make sure you're getting this, that you are not saved by what you do. You're saved by what Jesus did for you. So Romans five, this is what he says. Therefore, gotta pause. I didn't do this in the other services since we can run over to this one and who, you know, there's more time. Oh, we lost time, didn't we? Anyway, I'm gonna add this little detail. Whenever the Bible says therefore, you're supposed to notice what it's there for. <laughs> and in this case, it's therefore because he just got done saying a whole bunch of cool stuff about we're saved by grace through faith in chapter three and how Abraham was saved in the Old Testament the same way that we're saved in the New Testament by grace through faith. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. You see, we are saved by grace through faith. Now, years ago, actually centuries ago, there was a hymn writer that wrote an old hymn called Rock of Ages. It's from the 1750s. And yeah, I know that some old Def Leppard fans in here thought Def Leppard wrote the song Rock of Ages in 1983. That's how old you are. Um, and there was a show on the strip called Rock of Ages, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the old hymn from 1750. And this is, the hymn writer got it right. And this is his lyric for the first verse. Rock of Ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from the riven, thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save me from its guilt and power. Talking about Christ on the cross, we rest in that grace. He got grace, this guy. But this line, save me from its guilt and power. You see, there's a double problem with sin. So he wrote, be of sin the double cure. There's a double cure for sin that comes from God's grace. What is it? Well, that's what we're diving into. We introduced it last weekend. And the first part is being justified, which means just as if I had never sinned, being declared innocent, which saves me from the guilt of sin. Because when I know the law and I break it, I'm guilty and I've separated myself from a holy God and I need to be forgiven and I can't earn or deserve it back God in his grace gives me the opportunity by placing my guilt on the cross and the word literally means the gavel of the judge hits the bench and with that declaration of the judge, you go from being guilty to innocent. Just as if I never sinned. The first half of the double cure is justification. When I accept God's grace and it's applied to my life, I, my status before God goes from guilty to innocent. And that's awesome. And I think it's right for us to start with our guilt. As a matter of fact, I think there's something called healthy guilt. You know what healthy guilt is? When you have a conscience. Is the conscience of America different than it used to be? We are, as Christ followers, supposed to help develop the conscience of America. We are bringing light to the darkness. It's right for us to have a conscience, one that is well-formed and grounded upon truth. And an unhealthy conscience is when you feel guilty for the wrong things. A healthy conscience is when you feel guilty for the things you're supposed to feel guilty for. And when we have a healthy sense of guilt, by the way, everyone in, re in recovery uses the phrase, take a fearless inventory of your life. And many of us are in denial because we don't want to take a fearless inventory because when we do, it looks really bad. So we don't want to talk about our badness. Uh, everybody's got their stuff. Let's just 
No, if we take a fearless inventory and feel bad about it, we realize we have guilt. And here is the truth. Paul would say this about himself. He was the chief of sinners. And I would like to say personally, I'm a close second. And sometimes people go, but you're a pastor, you don't sin. And it's more than just what you do. Jesus taught that in the Sermon on the Mount. When he said, you've heard it said, don't kill, but I say if you hate, if you killed somebody in your heart, you know, don't lust, but I say, but don't commit adultery, but I say if you lust, you're guilty in your heart. Jesus took the actions and went beyond to the heart issues. And we understand that. And God is saying, what's up with that with you? And I, when I take a fearless inventory, did I say this is personal? This is personal. Some of you have crash and burn stories. And what I mean by that is you came to the end of your rope in a cell down at the jail or in prison. Some of you came at the end of your rope in some AANAGA meeting where your family said, you either go there or we'll never see you again. And you said, I, I got to change. Some of you came at the end of your rope when you got fired for doing what you shouldn't have been doing. I mean, what brings us to the end of the rope often is a crash and burn story. My family blew up, my marriage blew up. And you're going, I need grace. Some of us come to the end of our rope differently. And for me, it was the realization that being good enough isn't good enough. That no matter how I get to the best of me, there's a gap between my best and the holiness of God. And I can't earn or deserve that back with extra credit. I'm sitting here saying, help. I need Jesus. I don't know what your story is. But this is my personal story. And I think the universal aspect of this, that all of us have the same story, is that we come to the end of ourself. We need a Savior. The cross is the offer. And we receive that cross by faith, believing and trusting. Not just believing in, but trusting. We talked about this last week, trusting. The fact that we do something to evidence that we really believe. It's one thing to believe that a weight loss program will help you, but it's another thing to do it. Do you trust it? And the trusting is the action that proves the faith. One of the things we talked about last week was grace, that it's unmerited favor. Can't earn or deserve, I receive it as a gift. So we are saved by grace through faith in what Christ did on the cross. And with that, we get justified. So half the equation is taken care of. But now we got this other problem. The hymn writer said, be of sin the double cure, saved from, uh, from my guilt and the power of sin and its power. What does that mean? Well, I have a practice of sin. I, my status with God is I'm forgiven, but I still have this flesh, this skin that has desires and temptations. And I'm, my status is innocent, but as soon as I get the next temptation that I don't overcome, guess what? I become again a sinner. So what do I do then? There's a power in me that I can't say no to the darkness in me. There's a strength to this sin. And God goes, let me help you with that. I'll give you the Holy Spirit that comes in and lives in you. God in us, not just God with us as Jesus, God in us as the Holy Spirit. So there's a higher power in you now that you don't have to do what you don't want to do. That you can actually overcome and you can start to be set free from the patterns of sin in your life. And freedom comes as you grow. And we call that pro process sanctification. Here's a verse in 1 Corinthians 6. Paul talking to a church at Corinth. That was a church in a town like Las Vegas at the time. Full of really good sinners. That had been saved by grace. And as they were transformed, Paul starts, to, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Sanctified means to be set apart and to be made holy. To start to grow as a Christian where there's less sin in our life and more God in our life. That's what it means to being made holy, to be set free. Drew's gonna talk more about that next week. And the power of grace and the freedom of grace. 
what happens is we're saved from the guilt of sin and now we're being saved from the practice of sin. I'm justified, which says my, I'm declared innocent and I'm being sanctified, meaning I'm growing to be more godly. So I have less anger. My tongue is less vile. My actions are less dark as I come closer to God's grace. All of that came home to me in this Romans 5 passage when that little phrase in Romans 5, when I'm justified in this grace in which I now stand. And I was teaching elementary kids at church when I was going to seminary to learn that concept. And I go, how can I teach this great idea to elementary kids who are objective thinkers? You know, you, objective thinkers means that when Jesus said, I am the the, the, the gate, I am the door, I'm the shepherd, they think of gate, door, shepherd. I am the vine, he's the vine. The idea of transferring that to a concept is something their brains are starting to do. Just like math, the more objective math when you're younger, more subjective math when you get the age of 12 or so, maybe 10, it depends on how sharp, anyway. Um, the concepts start coming from the objectivity. I'm thinking, how can I objectively explain grace to a kid? And I thought the idea of a room, of being in grace in which you now stand. So this rug is our illustration. And when I'm standing here, am I in grace? No, I'm not. So I look at grace. What is great? The, the offer to be justified, to have be 100% innocent. I have to believe that that is for me. I have to humbly receive it. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I get in grace. I'm in. When I get in grace, I'm, a, I'm justified. How saved am I when I get in grace and I'm justified? 100%. Why? Because I go from guilty to innocent. So how I'm innocent, 100% saved when I'm right here. But when I'm here, I still may have an anger problem and a language problem and a lust problem and other problems. And I don't want that power in my life, so I want to grow, get closer to God, and get more of him. Now, in this room, that stool represents God, who's 100% holy. And right here, I'm about 20% holy. So I'm 20% sanctified, but how saved am I? 100%. Why? Because I'm in. Where am I? I'm in grace. So I'm 100% justified and 20% sanctified. And when I grow over here to 50%, how saved am I? 100%, trick question. I'm 100% saved because I'm 100% justified. Even though I'm 50% sanctified, and this is what's cool about growing. Because the closer I get to God, the more fruit of the Spirit I have, I have more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more gentleness, more faithfulness, more self-control. Is that good? We call it, we join Jesus and we get the life of God because God is the life giver. Sin always kills, steals, and destroys. And so if we hold on to our sin, it keeps us over here where we have less of all that good stuff. But as we repent and let the spirit of God give us strength to grow in our faith, we have more of, the, of God and less of our junk. We want to grow in Christ. It's really a good thing, but please notice I'm not saved by where I am in the room, I'm saved by grace through faith. You catching this? Here's a little bit more. So how do I get in the room? I express my faith. I've, I already said that, didn't I? Okay. What if I'm only 30% in? I want to make sure you get your blanks, all your high achievers. How saved am I? 100%. Here's a couple things the room of grace helped me understand. The standing I have in grace. What if I'm, I'm in grace and the last thing I do as a living human being is a sin? And the illustration is what if I'm in a car wreck and I hit the windshield and I say, Jesus Christ, and I wake up and there's Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I don't have a chance to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me for taking your name in vain. I'm just right there. Uh, and uh, he looks at me and I'm toast, right? As a matter of fact, burnt toast. I mean, we can get there, but it's, and uh, no. Because where did I die? In grace. God's grace covers all the sins of my past and all the sins of my future. I'm in this relationship with him. I'm in. This is amazing. Uh, what if I doubt? 
What if I'm wondering, I hear a documentary or read a book or challenges my faith in some way and go, I'm just not sure about this or not sure about that. If there is a faith beneath the doubt, meaning, do you still believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yeah. It's okay to have a question. You're saved by grace through faith. What about if you're mad at God? When do people typically get mad at God? When they've been hurt? When some grief hits their life? And they're mad at God. I don't even want to talk to God right now. And where are you when you're mad? You're in grace. And he says, go ahead and be mad. It'll take a while to heal. I'm with you. What if you grow and grow and grow and grow and you get all the way over here and you are so full of life and joy and grace and love and then some storms come your way, some hardships, some challenges, and you find yourself, maybe it's a new job that makes you busy and you can't spend as much time. Just the circumstances of life come and for whatever reason, you get into the wrong crowd and they kind of drag you down. For whatever reason, and you find yourself backsliding. You ever heard that phrase? Where are you? You're still in grace. You don't have, you're not as close to, as you were to the Lord. And you feel the distance, and I'm not sure I'm saved. I don't feel the same as I did over there. And the question is, are you saved by your feelings? You're saved by your faith in God's grace. It doesn't matter. Where are you? What's your standing with God? You're still in his grace. And by the way, you don't just slide out the door. Just like you don't just slide in the door. It takes an act of your will to receive the gift of grace. You don't just wake up in here and go, how did I get here? You understand God's grace is for you and you receive it. And you don't just wake up out here saying, how did I get here? It takes an act of your will saying, I no longer believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is not my Lord and Savior. That's pretty extreme. And there are some people in our church that have different opinions about that, which we're not going to argue right now. <laughs> All I know is I'm kept in grace by faith. I got in grace by faith in God's grace, and that's where I'm kept. So, starting to get this idea, when I fall, where do I fall? In grace. Are you going to stay down? Does God look at you and say, look at you, you fell. Or does he say, let me help you up and let's get going again? The Holy Spirit, by the way, is called the paraclete, the one who comes alongside and helps us. Instead of as a parent watching my kids learn to walk and I'm so sad that you fell, <laughs> try harder. I help them and I say, good try, buddy. Let's take another step. The concept of God is for us, that we are standing in his grace, is huge. There's one other, uh, I can come at this idea, and I, uh, hopefully I'm spurring a lot of thinking on your part about this idea about the room of grace, but I'm going to tell you one parable from Matthew chapter 20. It's a parable Jesus told, and you can read this in its entirety in, in, when you go home for your homework. It's the result of grace. You're not earning God's favor. Go read the Bible. All right, anyway. <laughs> Jesus told this parable. This guy owned a vineyard, and he had a lot of grapes, and they needed to be harvested. And he went to the marketplace, and he saw a bunch of guys who weren't working. And he said, hey, come and work in my vineyard. And that was 6 a.m. And he said, I'll pay you a day's wage. A lot of work. They said, great. And then he needed more workers. There were a lot of grapes, and he went to the marketplace, saw more guys not working, and he hired them at 9 o'clock. And he said, hey, come and work in my vineyard. I'll pay you a day's wage. They said, great. At noon, he went back, he had a lot of grapes, they were making progress, still had more to do. And he said, hey, come work in my vineyard, I'll pay you a day's wage, and they said, great. And they were still having a lot of work, but there was some more to be done, and he went to the market, and there were some guys not working, he said, hey, come work in my vineyard. And at four o'clock, he said, work in my vineyard, I'll pay you a day's wage, and they came and worked in his vineyard. So at five o'clock, at quitting time, the owner of the vineyard went to the four o'clock guys, the last will be first, and he said, here's a day's wage. He went to the noon guys and said, here's a day's wage. 
Went to the 9 guy, 9 a.m. guys, there's a day's wage. And we got to the 6 a.m. guys, they say, time out, boss. We've worked in your vineyard all day through the heat of the sun. And those guys only worked an hour. And we're getting the same pay as them. And the boss says, time out, employee. I'm paraphrasing. Time out, employee. I made a deal with you. The deal was, come work in my vineyard, I'll pay you a day's wage. I just paid you a day's wage. I upheld my contract. What is it to you if I want to be generous? So there are people that are on their deathbed in hospice, and they say, Jesus, I want you to save me from my sin. There are people in the last chapter of their life, people that have been following somewhat. And there's Mother Teresa and Billy Graham. <laughs> Guess what Mother Teresa and Billy Graham get? Day's wage. Which is grace. And I'll ask you the question, who's more grateful for grace? Is it these last minute folks? Or is it Mother Teresa and Billy Graham? It's upside down thinking. We don't think that way, but at the closer they are to the holiness of God, they realize how desperately they need the cross. I think they're more grateful, which makes them gracious. So instead of, this is how you can tell if somebody's gracious. As they're making this road, they're looking this way because they're not comparing themselves to the people behind them. When I was in college, that's what I was doing. I was saying, I'm better than you. Look how far I've come. But now that I understand grace, it's different. In your program uh, is a card that says, I'm in. And I want you to make this personal. And so if you would pull it out and just hold it. I want to pray and I want to send us into the next part of our service, which we're creating a moment for all of us. And if you don't have enough, you can share it, you can take turns, whatever, but pull it out. And I want to pray as we do this. God, I thank you for this moment and I thank you for this concept and I thank you for the truth of your amazing grace. And God, I pray that the power of the truth will transform and impact our lives to the depth of our soul. That's our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Just hold it, look at the word I'm in as the band sings a song and we have stuff after this music so don't leave because this is the song. This is inserted as a moment to help you process. What we've been talking about, I'm gonna come back and lay in the plane. Hold this in your lap as you listen to this song. Stop. 
So the question is, where are you? You outside? Looking in? Got some questions you still need to be answered. Got some conversations that need to be had. Well, I just encourage you to take the next step. Make sure you do those. And maybe that's your choice today. Some of you have been on the step looking in, hesitating, I'm not really sure. And maybe today is the day that you receive grace and name Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you step in. And you say, I'm in. Maybe some of you need to take another step or two. You've been stuck. We say, it's just as good as it gets, is all I got. And you're not living at all the full life that God wants you to have. And maybe you can say, I'm for life, strong relationships, strong friends, and use my strength that I want to take next steps. And some of you have been in for a while and it's time to just receive and accept and celebrate and honor who God is. So if you would, please stand and hold your cards. In just a moment, you can share it, take turns. We're gonna sing a couple more verses of this song, but before we do, I'm gonna to count to three and allow this to be a moment, maybe for your first time or to reaffirm again that you're in God's grace. And if you are, just hold up the card. And if you want to hold up the card and sing as we sing, um, this is a great offering to God. So you ready? One, two, three. I'm in. There you go. For some of you that may have taken, that was awesome. For some of you that have uh, taken this step for the first time on the back, we have some instructions on encouragements of what to do for your next steps. And you can come down front today and tell it to someone. 
or someone that you're with here, going verbal with your faith is a way to confirm what you just did, and that's a great idea, and some other next steps that can be done. And so we'll have folks down front here ready to talk to and pray with if you want to do that also in the lobby. We're so grateful that you've come. Uh, next weekend's going to be a great message on grace. That brings freedom and what that really means. But right now, I want to uh, lead us in a prayer before we go. God, I thank you for your amazing grace. And I pray that your grace will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Be with us as we go, that what we have received, that we will share with others that need your grace so much. We ask for your strength and your covering in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings. Have a good weekend. Come back next week.